Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Damien Cummings, and you've got me for about an hour. In that time, what I want to do is give a 45-minute presentation about going beyond the hype, talking about uh, generative AI, what it means for your job, what it means for work, and what it might mean for our future. So let me get into it. First of all, a little bit about me. My name is Damien Cummings. I'm the Chief of Digital Strategy and Leadership Practice here at NUS ISS. Like all of our uh, lecturers and, and pract we're practitioners at heart. So I've been living the digital world for the last 30 or so years. Uh, before I was uh, my last three years here at NUS, I've actually been to big corporates uh, such as Standard Chartered Bank, Philips and Samsung at the forefront of sales, marketing and digital. Uh, I have a number of master's, uh, master's degrees and I'm also working through a PhD thesis on the intersection of artificial intelligence and digital platforms. So uh, I hope you could take what I say uh, as some of you's been there and done it and hopefully give you some practical tips. But enough about me. What I want to do is talk about AI. Now, AI is a complex topic. Now, of course, AI has been discussed since the 1960s. Of course, last year when ChatGPT became mainstream, it really hit public consciousness. So I've got a very confusing looking chart up there that talks about the different aspects of AI. Everything from autonomous systems, machine learning and deep learning, uh, pattern recognition, um, large language models, and so on. We're not going to talk about the technology today. I want to talk about the implications of it. So I'm not going to uh, bamboozle you with jargon, not going to go to deep technical terms. But what I do want to do is talk about what we're seeing in the market right now in terms of generative AI and AI in general, and what it might mean for you and your job. So as a reference, there's a lot of hype. I put this chart here not to kind of give you more information on this space, but to tell you there's a lot of companies in this space. If you're a startup or in the venture capital scene, what you've probably noticed is about 8% of new startups are getting funded are an AI type startup. Now, a lot of these are wrappers around existing core technologies, such as ChatGPT or OpenAI. So a lot of different uh, new technologies are coming up. Now, I don't recommend you get out your magnifying glass and read this chart, but if you do want to reference it, there are many of these online. It does give you a sense of how complex the AI is becoming. So let's get into it. What is generative AI or Gen AI? So let's go beyond the hype and really look, look at what it means. So first of all, let's talk about the easy stuff. Again, I have to admit, uh, this is uh, some generative AI of me. Sure, it's more attractive, a little bit skinnier. So generally, uh, the AI has been very kind to me. This was generated by a simple text prompt. All I did was put professional photos of Damien Cummings. Luckily, there's enough photos of me out there in the internet where I can actually upload my own reference photos. And it comes back with these brand new images that I never created and have been taken with the camera. Uh, at the moment, I'm actually looking at doing my book. So I'm not a manga artist. I don't know how to do digital illustration. But with a simple text prompt, I can create detailed characters with rich history. And this was done using the mid-journey. Uh, if you're familiar with the recent movies Barbie or Oppenheimer, uh, you might have heard of the Barbieheimer phenomenon. Uh, and somebody somewhere created these images up on the internet. And it was a simple text prompt. Albert Einstein wearing a pink suit, maybe in a pink room. And these amazing images that have been completely generated from nothing. So this is what we're seeing as generative AI. I think when you look at uh, text prompting, it's now kind of text to images, text to text, what we're seeing with ChatGPT or Google Bard. We're also seeing text to video and even text to app. So you can create an app, a uh, piece of software with a simple text prompt. So we're now seeing the evolution of text to images and we're seeing a fast, rapid uh, increase from uh, images into things like text to video. I'll show you.
Imagine it, you can create. So I presented images. Now we're talking about actually creating videos from a simple text prompt. And now there are kind of mainstream tools that are hitting the market. One of which is something called uh, Adobe and a tool called uh, Firefly. So that's the quick intro into what Gen AI can be. Uh, text to image, text to video, images to video, or apps or other productivity. Now, that's the hype. That's what you've all seen out there. That's what's getting a lot of uh, shares on LinkedIn and other social media platforms. But today is not really about kind of just talking about the technology. I need to go beyond the hype and answer the big questions, some of which are frivolous, some of which are very important. And I'm going to go through these six things. Is AI going to take over the world? Are we going to be reporting into robotic overboards anytime soon? Uh, is AI alive? Does it have emotions or feelings? Will you lose your job? Uh, will AI make your work any easier or change what we do? Does AI have biases? And of course, what does the future of AI or the future of humanity look like? So there's a lot of hype. I've shown you some already. I want to go beyond the hype and give you straightforward answers. And that's what this session is around for the 40 minutes or so. So let me ask the let me ask and answer the big question. Will AI take over the world? Will we be answering for a robot anytime soon? Well, when we think about that, we might be thinking about a future that where Terminator or Skynet has risen up and taken over and try to destroy humanity. It might look a bit like this. Well, I'm the bearer of good news. It's not going to happen. Uh, AI will not take over the world, at least in the foreseeable future. Now, having said that, there's been a lot of hype out there. There have been business leaders out there, uh, Elon Musk being one of them. We've also had the CEO of OpenAI going saying that AI must be regulated. And that makes sense. So there's both business, technology, ethicists, and also politicians are saying that we need to get a firm handle and a grasp on the regulation around AI. There are dangers that AI pose, but those are more about bioethics rather than robots rising up and shooting us with lasers. That's not going to happen in the short term. The real danger is a bit more insidious, a misinformation, blurring barriers of what's real, and also uh, political unrest, using it as a tool for propaganda, like we're seeing in different wars in the world at the moment. So the next big thing beyond the hype, is AI alive? No, it's not. And that's good news. But hey, last year there was a New York Times reporter that uh, was actually chatting to ChatGPT via Bing. And 
it felt like AI was starting to hallucinate. It started to say things like, I'm in love with you, I want to be alive, and so on. So, issues going on there, but it certainly doesn't reflect AI being alive. It's programmed. So, no, AI is not alive. This is only science fiction. It's not a reality at this stage. But we can't agree whether there's going to be uh, a version of sentience of AI in the future. A little bit later, I'm going to talk about the idea of technology singularity. We are predicting that around 45 to 2050, AI will not only surpass human intelligence, but it will be billions of times smarter than us and smarter than the collective human combined, which would be very interesting times indeed. But even if AI is not alive, it is, and it can fake it. It's learning to read your emotions. So what I'm going to show you might be the world's creepiest video of an AI that's been put inside a robot. It's actually looking inside a mirror and learning different facial recognition and facial emotions that, to better interact with humans. That is the world's creepiest video, but uh, it does illustrate a point. Imagine, uh, and you can see it here, an AI being put inside a robotic body. Uh, does an AI express emotions or is it alive? No, of course not, but it doesn't matter. When human relationships are so important for actually any kind of new technology, and what we're going to see is the proliferation of AI and robotics at the same time. Technology comes in clusters. And what we're seeing is the rise of AI going to give us a massive rise in robotics as well. So even if it can't love us back, we are falling in love with robots and ourselves. So it's going to be a very interesting time over the next five to 10 years as this starts to become more mainstream. Now, to the crux of the questions, are you going to lose your job because of AI? Yes. The short answer is there's going to be a change in, in the skill sets and the technology landscape which means that so old skill sets are going to kind of die off and new skill sets are going to be in demand. In fact, it's predicted that there are going to be 69 million new positions created by 2027, so it's only three or four years away. But at the same time, 83 million jobs are going to be reduced or laid off. That's a net loss of about 14 million jobs worldwide. The hardest hit are administrative and clerical workers that are about 26 million of those 18 million uh, jobs are going to be at risk. So if you're in a position where you're doing highly repeatable, manual, process-driven work, there's probably going to be an AI that takes your job. Now, before you start panicking, let me be very specific of what jobs there are most at risk. These are the jobs that actually are most at risk. Now, let me kind of deep dive into the top five. So if you work in food preparation, construction, cleaning, driving, or in agricultural labor, you're probably at deep risk. Now, uh, some of us on this call might be doing kind of side hustles with uh, uh, Uber, Lyft, Grab, Gojek, et cetera, uh, doing driving. Now, you can imagine in the not too distant future, we're going to see AI inside cars. We're already seeing it with things like Tesla and Autopilot. And kind of, uh, the roads are kind of driven by an AI to uh, kind of almost have a hive mind with different vehicles talking to each other. Driverless technology has been around for some time. With AI getting smarter and smarter, it's going to make uh, driverless vehicles uh, even more uh, powerful over the next uh, little while. So that's, that's the ones at most, most risk. Now, I think everyone on this particular webinar is probably not in this category. So let's go back and actually look at that from the bottoms up. So I'm sorry to say, if you go from the bottoms up, I, this might be the last time you ever see me or talk to me because teaching is at risk. So jobs like mine, if I'm a lecturer, a professor, or a teacher, uh, it could be automated. Now, if you think about it, an AI avatar looks like a, you know, an attractive person with a thumb of human knowledge at fingertips through the internet or deep learning. That person can do a much better job than I can. Uh, of course, they don't give you that human connection and insight, but they have a deep level of knowledge. With the rise of like, online learning, uh, skill-based training can be done in time at your own pace. 
So it means the role of the teacher has, may have to be quite a facilitator rather than someone who's giving an option. So I'm out of a job. I'm sorry. But uh, what I like is the second lowest point there, the second from the bottom. Upper management and politics. Maybe contentious here, but if you think about it, what does a politician really do? Well, I think what they do is they make decisions. They make decisions based on their population, which is really a whole bunch of data that they're gathering. And in certain countries, those politicians earn a lot of money. Could you replace them with an AI? Well, I mean, Singapore, it's unlikely that the Singapore government's going to be replaced by AI soon. But uh, what we might see is smaller countries that say, hey, well, we maybe don't have the depth of talent here. Maybe we do want to rely on AI minister, a ministerial advisor, or even a prime minister or president at some point in the near future. Same kind of thing with upper management. In the US, CEO has a value around about 800 times that frontline staff. Again, what does the CEO do? Set a vision, uh, rally people together, but ultimately they're trying to make decisions. They make decisions from large data. And again, I'm not saying the Fortune 500 companies are certainly going to take on an AI CEO, but we will see innovative startups and smaller companies that might defer to an AI CEO year or two. And that'll be the floodgates. Once that happens, there'll be studies that prove whether they're more effective or less effective than a human being in charge. For the rest of us, have a look in the middle. Science and engineering, information technology, business administration, customer service, sales. That feels like people in this call. So you're at risk. Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, I'm a salesperson or I'm, I, I interact face to face with different people. They can never replace my job. Well, let me show you a quick video from Google that talks about it's, it's a few years old now. They were showcasing a technology called Duplex for customer service. Now, uh, to be fair, what they've done is they've closed down Duplex and they've rolled that under their AI and their Google Bard division now. So, this is a few years old. But you get a sense of how human and AI can really be. And many of the potentially non-face-to-face -face interactions could well be replaced by AI. So it's a little bit long, but it's a very entertaining video. The progress with the assistant. As I said earlier, our vision for our assistant is to help you get things done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. You may want to get an oil change schedule, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. You know, we are working hard to help users through those moments. We want to connect users to businesses in a good way. Businesses actually rely a lot on this, but even in the US, 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. 
It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning, text-to-speech. By the way, when we are done, the assistant can give you a confirmation notification saying your appointment has been taken care of. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Um, Today, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we leave here for like upper like five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh, no, it's not too busy. You, you, you can count for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. So, very interesting. So, if you go back to that list, uh, think about those sales jobs, those customer service jobs. Do you want to be stuck on an IVR waiting 20 minutes for the human operator to be there? Or those kind of experiences that Google Shake hosted years ago sound just like you're talking to a real person. If they give you accurate information and solve your problem, do you really need that human interaction? It's going to be very Now, of course, we do know that sort of even though that AI can solve things from a process perspective, there is going to be a premium of human, uh, human elements. Uh, imagination, creativity, morals, ethics, those are the kind of things that become uh, even more in the and it's interesting, what we're going to see is we're going to see a return of, uh, uh, I think, face-to-face -face communication. That human interaction is going to be less about sending something on WhatsApp or email, much more about getting people face-to-face -face in short intent for collaboration, because they always have everything else for you. So the key question outside of will you lose your job is going to be, will AI make your work easier? I'm going to play two quick videos. One that's actually a Microsoft product called Copilot that's now being integrated in Microsoft uh, 365. And then Google's products, which is being integrated into their Google Workplace workspace. Copilot in Excel helps you make sense of all your data. Say you need to analyze this quarter's sales results. You start by asking Copilot to analyze the data and give you three key trends. Within seconds, you've got what you need. But you want to drill in. You ask Copilot a follow-up question about one of the trends. Copilot creates a new sheet, giving you a sandbox to play in and helping you better understand what's happening. You ask Copilot to visualize what contributed to the decline in sales growth this period. Copilot adds a little color to make the problem jump off the page. Now you want to dig deeper and ask a follow-up question with a what-if scenario. Copilot not only answers your question, it creates a simple model and even asks if you want to learn more about what it did with a step-by-step -step breakdown. Finally, you can ask it to create a graph of your projected model. Copilot in Excel turned a sea of data into clear insights and actions. Not an expert in Excel, data science, or finance, uh, your new best friend is going to be Microsoft Copilot. The ability for a simple text prompt to analyze data, format it into a Excel table is amazing. That's the first step. And this is not a product five years in the making, uh, coming up next year or coming up in five years' time. This is something that's available right now. I'll show you Google's version of this. It's a bit more comprehensive, but you can see the impact of an AI pilot idea across all aspects of office-based communication.
Two technologies there. One was uh, Microsoft and the Copilot being integrated with Office 365, and what Google is introducing for Workspace, their version of Office 365. Now, you might have might have glossed over some of the things that just, that just were presented in that video. Let me just go back and explain. The first thing you see is uh, somebody's asking the AI to catch up on the email thread. Give them a summary of what people have been talking about. Next, it asks the AI to do a response. So in one simple sentence, you've got an email. We're in the world where your AI is to talk to my AI, and we're barely involved in the process. Fast forward, then ask the AI to actually, from that email trail, create a document, a Word document or a, or a similar Google Doc. Uh, and the document is just instantly created. Sure, there's some editing you can do on the fly of that document, but the core of it's there. Moving forward, it was asked to then create a presentation from that Word document, uh, like a PowerPoint presentation or slides or, or equivalent. And you can see those slides just automatically just appearing there. Inside the presentation, uh, it was looking for a custom image, like a magic card. So within the tool itself, you can simply say, uh, let's, uh, I need a garden, some butterfly, some magic, and an image, a set of images just are created. And you can insert that instantly into your presentation. After that, you can see uh, people doing an thing. Meeting notes were taken automatically. Action items were captured. Uh, there's a full agenda and meeting taken. After that, an Excel spreadsheet was updated with bespoke and custom messages to all of the clients in that long spreadsheet. And finally, there was a thank you message that was drafted and sent to that person's team members. This is not 10 years from now, this is today. What we're going to see is with Microsoft and Google introducing this into the technology that we use every day in Microsoft Office, in a PowerPoint presentations and so on, we're going to see a significant shift in the type of work office, work office workers do. In fact, AI is the game changer for work. Uh, we're seeing that these tools, Google Bard, uh, Journey for Image, ChatGPT, they're going to revolutionize the way in fact, it's estimated that up to 80% of an average office worker or white collar worker's job will be automated using So, when I talk about 80% job losses over the next four years, I'm talking about someone, if your whole job is to create Excel spreadsheets or do a PowerPoint presentation, write Word documents, and you can do it just as well as you can, maybe better. For the rest of us, I mean, I had to create this presentation, I had to do Excel spreadsheets. I'm not good at all of it. I might not be a Word document writer, an Excel spreadsheet writer, but now I don't have to be because AI is going to be doing it for me. This is a significant change, a very, very significant culture and societal change. Now, sure, these tools are not cheap, so not every company is going to be rolling into Google. But for most of us, it's going to become mainstream in 2024. Now you have a choice to make. Do you want to keep up to date with this and make sure you're on the leading edge of these kind of technologies? Or are you going to be behind in the same way that uh, old school people using paper were left behind? And this is happening right now. Does AI have bias? So we've talked about uh, big tech, Google, OpenAI, uh, Microsoft, etc., launching these type of tools. But does AI have bias? I'll show you a quick video that might explain some of those biases. This is why you should avoid mixing Barbie with biased AI image generators. What does a typical prisoner look like? What about a lawyer? A nurse? A drug dealer? What about a fast food worker? A cleaner? 
a terrorist, or a CEO. These are all images created by an artificial intelligence image generator called Midjourney, which creates unique images based off of simple word prompts. These exaggerated biases that AI systems create are known as representational harms. These are harms which degrade certain social groups by reinforcing the status quo or by amplifying stereotypes. A particularly extreme example was created when BuzzFeed published an article of AI-generated Barbies from different countries around the world. The Barbies from Latin America were all presented as fair-skinned, perpetuating a form of discrimination known as colorism, where lighter skin tones are favoured over darker ones. The Barbie from Germany was dressed in clothes reminiscent of an SS Nazi uniform, and the Barbie from South Sudan was depicted holding a rifle by her side. We need to be educated and intentional about how we use AI image generators. As computer scientist and digital activist Joy Balamwini puts it, whether AI will help us reach our aspirations or reinforce unjust inequalities is ultimately up to us. What are some examples of representational harms you've come across recently? So I don't agree with everything that was said in that video, but it is a good illustration. Because AI is biased, not because the technology is flawed, but because of the data and the rules that are applied to it. It's flawed because of the, uh, how it's coded and the biases that are being put in there by the creator. So if it's actually an American company, it might be a left view of ethics and culture that they've integrated into the tool. But what AI is really doing is picking up stereotypes. It's picking up data points from the internet and it actually has no particular view of that. So you can see there was some questionable kind of Barbie video. Uh, German Barbie and this Nazi uniform. Uh, there's an African Barbie that had an AK-47 machine gun. Now, of course, that, that's not great. But having said that, it's picking up from stereotypes somewhere, or it's picking up from a bias. Uh, I'm less worried about that. That's not something that's going to impact the What I am worried about is the information and digital propaganda that comes along with this. It's very, very easy now to take an image of somebody, turn that into a full video like we just saw there, or a presentation. So you could take the a video or a set of images of the Prime Minister of Singapore, a uh, leader of the country, a uh, business leader, for example, and plug in a simple speech, making policy change, uh, panicking the population, or saying something outrageous. And it's very hard to distinguish that kind of reality uh, from this digital misinformation. So not only is there going to be buying the system from the creators of these AI, right? and primarily American big tech, but uh, also how it can be used for information, digital propaganda, and other nefarious schemes by bad actors. And we are starting to see this with the different war zones. Israel at the moment, uh, propaganda from both sides uh, with pretty, some pretty extreme views. And that's very, very worrying. So AI is only going to make the digital misinformation out over the coming few years. So the last section I want to talk about before I sum up is what does the future of AI look like? Now, I'm not going to go beyond the hype here. I've tried to give you straight answers on everything so far. So here's where I jump into the hype and, and run the hype train myself. So what is AI, what does the future of AI look like? Well, it depends on what you believe. Now, I love kind of talking about the future because you don't have to be super accountable for it. I can say anything else. But there is a body of literature out there talking about something called the technology singularity or simply the singularity. It's estimated that around about 2045, about 20 or so years from now, maybe a little bit sooner, AI is going to grow at such an exponential rate, it's smarter than a human brain and gets smarter than the collective human knowledge. If that happens, the singularity is a point where technology growth actually becomes uncontrollable. But it also means that AI becomes so smart, or the new cluster of technology becomes so smart, it might even unlock some of the deep mysteries of the universe. With that kind of brain power, maybe backed up by quantum computing and similar technology, we could use uh, new technologies such as uh, molecular nanotechnology to create things from nothing a faster than light space travel, or even de-aging, so we can actually look like our ideal uh, body and mentality for effectively forever, to be functionally immortal. There's new technologies that sound like science fiction, but might be reachable within a lifetime. 25 years is not long. 
It's also been predicted that uh, within about five years, as soon as five years, we're going to achieve artificial general intelligence, AGI. AGI is when an AI has all the processing power of a human brain and can do the same capability as a human can. So we can have a conversation like this, the crunch of mathematical numbers, they can search the internet, walk your dog, uh, actually do almost everything or more than a human can within five years. So that's, that's a tough one. So we're seeing the exponential rate of technology. Now, what happens is any new technology uh, brings a cluster of other associated technologies. In this case, we're talking about quantum computing, augmented reality, uh, and things like robotics all rising with AI. In fact, what we're seeing is that uh, AI could be considered the next foundational technology. So these have been kind of like the industrial revolution, then the digital age, so like personal computers, mobile phones, and now the internet in the last 20, 25 years. What we're going to see over the next 20 years, about 50 to 100 years, it will happen in a short space of time. Uh, so that's one part. So it could be a lot of things that we need to do for. Regardless of whether AI or not, we are experiencing exponential new technology. Things are happening in my feels like 100 years after. We all went through COVID and we did transformation was compressed into that time frame. Most organizations had about 10 years of digital transformation, got it done in one or two. So a lot of our old school and traditional companies caught up with digital. Now we're moving into a post-digital world powered by AI. It's been publicly reported that AGI, or artificial general intelligence, has a 50-50 chance of appearing in five years' time, uh, certainly with a 20-year time frame. Maybe. We're, it's the next foundational uh, technology. There's been a lot of hype around in the past about blockchain, NFTs, and stuff. That was never a foundational technology. It was a splinter of something else. That forced us to make a choice between centralized and decentralized. Artificial intelligence requires much choice. It layers on top of what we're Artificial intelligence supports digital platforms, supports the internet, allows us to do new, things, new discoveries in healthcare and medicine, in, in business, in science, in all kinds of technology. As I said, there's a cluster of new technologies that may be coming. Robotics, augmented reality, proper metaverse, where it's an internet that you inside of in the 30s. As I said, the technology singularity may happen, but at that point, we cannot control the growth anymore. It's uncontrollable technology growth that's going to lead us to the stars or lead us to ruin. And I can tell you it's an absolute fact as you're going to struggle to keep up. Even someone like me that does this professionally, I talk about digital strategy, I talk about transformation, I talk about and all kinds of technology in my day job. I'm doing a postgraduate education, I kind of use uh, things like a day-to-day -day basis for my personal projects, and I'm struggling. So if you're not committing that level of effort, you're further behind than even someone like me. Is. And that's going to be a challenge. All of humanity at the moment are going to struggle to keep up with this. The ch pace of change is just happening so quickly. So to summarize, beyond the hype, and adding a little bit of hype at the end, here are key things. So number one, is AI going to take over the world? Not in a foreseeable way where robots rise up and kind of um, race. That, that's not going to happen. But maybe it's going to happen over the course of 25 or 50 years as we become transhuman if AI becomes smart enough and unlike Is AI alive? No, it's not. But it doesn't really matter because if it can mimic human emotions and act like it is, well, what's the, what's the point of differentiating? P uh, humans are going to fall in love with AI and robots, they're going to choose to be with robots. AI companions. And will you lose your job? Maybe. Possibly. Depends what kind of job you have. Like all new technology, there's always going to be some big shifts in the skill sets required, how we use tech, and so on. The worry, of course, is that if up to 80% of our job is automated with these co-pilots, what are you going to do with it in time? What I hope to see is that people use it to engage in face-to-face -face interactions, to engage with each other to put a premium on those human emotions, the human skill sets like imagination, creativity, ethics, and so on. Will it make your work, will it make your work easier? Absolutely it will. 
There's no doubt about that. It's happening in 2023, will happen in 2024 and beyond. Does AI have biases? Yes, and we have to be aware of those are human biases by the companies that create these and from the data sets that they collect. The more data sets that they collect out there, we tend to focus on and congregate around stereotypes. And, and what's the future look like? Well, I can't predict anything, but what I can tell you is we're going to keep up. It's going to be a real challenge. But with that, thank you very much. And let's move to questions now. Okay, so I'm just going to point out some questions and see if I can answer those. I see um, first one is, how do you think we can revamp our So uh, we're talking about biases here. So how could we revamp and, and uh, rewrite these biases? Well, of course, it comes down to data. The challenge is going to be uh, AI doesn't start off encoded with a bias. It actually uses large language and data sets to actually learn behavior. The more inputs it goes in, the more training it requires. So we can retrain AI by actually kind of giving clean sets or to actually apply AI in specific environments. So AI for healthcare can be trained up to deal with healthcare-based challenges. AI for education can be focused on the best quality education without a bias. Where, the, where you're going to run into a real problem is if it's a broad AI, like a Google Bar, chat GPT, that's when you're going to run into trouble. And I don't think you can retrain that with conditioning data. Move to the next question. Uh, okay, so um, uh, next one is the Philippines-based question. So from the Philippines here, uh, we all know that the elected president won heavily due to information, maybe. Uh, do you think we can regulate these things globally, political propaganda around the world? No, we can't. The reality is um, uh, AI is a tool. Uh, it revolves around a regulatory environment and, of course, to be good actors as well as actors. What I think is going to be some countries that actually kind of take the high road, regulate misinformation. And what I think is going to happen is market forces. We're going to see different uh, market forces that require us to have trust and faith in a particular AI. If we don't have trust and faith in that AI, it will fail in market forces. Competitors will just come in, more trustworthy and better. But I think what we're going to see is some of the more advanced uh, cultures around the world choose to take that high road, uh, regulate information and we are seeing that at the moment but uh, not all countries are going to be equal and it's going to take some time to do it but it tends to be at a very country level i don't think it's anything at a regional level in the short term uh, next is about skills so what interdisciplinary skills will be most beneficial for working effectively in technology well this is a great one because we're interested in well, there's a few things. Hard technology skills are not what you need for. It's not about kind of understanding Python or going into detail of large language model. It's about soft skills. Uh, a simple one would be uh, prompting, understanding how to get the most out of a particular AI technologies. Uh, a very specific skill set to get the best out of major daily. Uh, understanding those simple prompts and getting the most out of it with which is tough. That's an easy one. But then for the rest of it, to make use of it, it's more about strong communication skills, change management, stakeholder management, and thinking strategically about what we do with that. Now. So I'd say focus on the, on the soft skills, change management, agility, uh, stakeholders, plus also becoming a bit of a prompt engine. And you uh, Next question. Do you think AI can shape our perception of the user? Come and quite manipulate people's feelings and thoughts. Yes, it's doing it already. That's what propaganda is. So AI will in a certain way. It's going to be hard. And again, we, we tend to rely on something which is very simple. So what might happen is that we start using a particular AI to send our emails for us to give us the information. And we're certainly seeing that in the world. People chat GPT to kind of write help them with and so on. And then we take shortcuts. We start relying on it, and we take what it says uh, as, as truthful. There are cases around the world at the moment where uh, ChatGPT or Google Bar, similar tools, are returning wrong information. 
or even delusion. So in the short term, we're going to be looking at what the reason is not. But as a tool for misinformation and propaganda, it's a very powerful one. It's something we need to be very careful. Uh, next one, uh, do you think AI can be smart enough to filter human biases and order to correct it? Yes, but not now. What we're saying is we have the baby version of AI. It's learned, it doesn't really kind of uh, have its own ability to think and filter. It's really just a very large machine learning algorithm. What we are going to see is it gets better and better. And AI eventually creates its own AI, and that AI is slightly more out of, out of human control. What will then happen is that they will be able to filter out and understand the nuances between someone putting in a or someone putting in a but that's a kind of difficult road to go down, which is the correct solution. If you're in America at the moment, they have a very left-wing view of the world. If you're actually in another country, which is much more totalitarian, they might have a right-wing view of the world. But is right or left-wing even the right answer? Most people are kind of somewhere. We have different, different views on uh, things like um, key topics. Uh, there's only one country I've seen that, that handles this very well, which is Switzerland, which has a large number of Ideas. Maybe what we'll see is a change in the government model and governance model around getting people to actually vote on key issues very simply, very digitally to get a consensus on things moving forward. But I don't think AI should ever be in the position it tells us what to do, but it should be able to filter out more effectively truth from misinformation. Uh, question. Thanks for the engaging sharing. Oh, thank you for being here. So what are the key skill sets that humans should acquire in the next five, ten years? Right. So uh, I touched on this before, but I think it's in the short term, it's soft skills. In the short term, jump into quantum computing, understand how to use augmented reality devices, and if you want to develop a career, jump into devices. I don't think there's going to be a lot of uh, call at the moment for a code right there. I think that ship has sailed. But the cluster of technologies around AI quantum computer being developed over the next five to ten years in the twenties, robotics, which are on the rise at the moment, and wearable tech, which is the next uh, generation of what we're seeing with uh, getting phones replaced, something like this. Uh, that's all going to be the popular skill sets required. So yes, you can become a coder, but you need to be the best of the best in coding. So if you're entering that new space, go for an uncontested area of quantum computing. If you have those hard skills, you'll be optimized. For everyone else, great soft skills across the board. Human skills focused on actually collaboration and interaction with each other. And uh, next question is, most companies and startups in AI seem to sidestep the issue of copyright and have freely scrape data sets without consent. Is there any way that copyright protection can be enforced? No, there's not. In fact, uh, the US court ruling that said that uh, images that are actually created through mid and similar AI tools cannot be copyrighted. And that's one aspect. Of course, they're pulling from existing artworks. So we're seeing at the moment, if you have your artwork, or you have your uh, content or your uh, creativity out there in the public on a blog and a social network site, you've got to be aware that it's eventually going to get scraped by AI and for their purposes. Again, it comes down to a bigger issue of do you trust big tech? Do you trust Microsoft or Facebook or any company that have access to all your data, all your creativity, and so on? And of course, it comes down to typically, do you have enough money to sue uh, Microsoft or Google company? So if they have stolen your fantastic JPEG or your uh, oil colored uh, oil painting, what can you really do about it? Sure, there'll be kind of advocacy group and ethics groups that come up and actually challenge that, but the reality is you're seeing it with social networks right now. They have all the power. The best thing you can do is not make your art publicly available. Put it behind the page, put it behind the private page, showcase it to a collection of individuals. The Patreon, for example, it won't get scraped in that manner. So short term, doesn't sound very positive. Long term, not sure. Uh, next question. Uh, what actions do you suggest people who have their jobs at risk by the proliferation of AI? Uh, increased focus on the human touch. Well, 
I'll, I'll be blunt. I think if you're in those super high ad risk categories, you need to consider a career transition ASAP. The reality is all new technology changes the skill sets and changes the jobs that are required. A is just the next big one. Think about if you were back in 1995 and the internet and digital was coming. If we saw the impact that it has, every website has been built, websites became a thing, e-commerce became a thing. Uh, we used apps on phones. I mean, it's become such an integrated part of our world. But if you were a paper-based person or a, you're doing a manual job back in those days, could see what was happening in terms of digital, you'd probably want to change and jump on that band. I recommend you do the same here. You don't have to become an AI expert to kind of have a great career. But I think if you are in a, a job where your uh, work is repeatable, uh, automated, manual, then so I highly recommend going through an upskilling program to think about what you really want to do. What kind of job is going to do your skill sets and what skills you need to develop to get into the future. I can't answer that for you, but I think go after your passion and it will be your mind. But get out of something that's going to be repeatable. That's the best I've got. Uh, next one, how do we correct data bias? Uh, I don't know. That's a, it's a real challenge. So correcting data bias is going to be an issue. Uh, the best way I think we're going to see uh, data biases will always exist on the platforms like ChatGPT globally going to be getting data more. So that's going to be a challenge. So I think when AI is very specific to an industry or very specific to a country, that's when you're going to get the right accurate data sets and sort it out very quickly. Or it could be simple community management. If you can report kind of a wrong file or a mistake it's made or you clearly identify coming back is incorrect, it's going to self-learn over time. But it's not an easy answer to this. So it's going to be a niche for particular industries, for particular countries, and so making sure that the data is going to be clean in the first place. But it's going to be a challenge. Data is always a I think the last question we have time for is um, what master's undergraduate degree do you think is the most flexible in income? <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. Well, I mean, uh, one of the things that we do here at NUSISS is we teach these courses. So don't like this question. It was actually legitimate. But uh, one of the things that we often do is we have a couple of uh, degrees which are very, very uh, Master of Technology and Digital Leadership. It helps you with the soft skills to be a digital in the future. With entrepreneur or actually kind of transforming an existing enterprise, it's a great, uh, great program to go through. We have a Master's in Enterprise Analytics. And we also, surprisingly, uh, have a master's in artificial intelligence systems. So any of those, if you're uh, technically minded, go into the intelligence systems or an AI. If you're more of a data and analytics, uh, the enterprise analytics, uh, but if you're more broadly interested, either do an MBA, uh, we have great ones for an NUS business school, or the Master of Technology and Digital Leadership here, which is very good to give you a grant all the technology which is a very nice way to actually end the session. But with that, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the next webinar. Thank you.